Hi, Ron Spomer with a question. What is the world's smallest rifle cartridge? And what's the world's most powerful rimfire cartridge? Well, the answers to that and a lot more on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors. Before we uncover the world's smallest cartridge, I want to thank our patrons on Patreon for suggesting this topic. <laughs> and of course, we want to thank them for their support. They, as we always say, help keep the lights on. If you're interested in joining us at Ron Spomer Outdoors, just go to patreon.com and Ron Spomer Outdoors. We'd sure appreciate the help. Now, we did a little survey of our patrons and asked them what they would like to see us covered. And I think number two or three on the list was the 17s. Now, most of us know the 22 calibers, and it's pretty small. The 22 long rifle would be one of the world's smallest cartridges, but the 22 short is even smaller. So, if you guessed 22 short, close but no cigar, there is an even shorter one, and it's a 17. Now, the actual length is the same, but the power is different. It actually has a little more power than the 22 or at least a little more reach. So we are going to cover rim fires today. There are 17 caliber center fires as well, but we're going to get pretty busy just covering the rim fire. So we'll do the center fires another time. Today is rim fire time. So the first rim fire cartridge was really the first self-contained cartridge, a brass cartridge that had the primer in it, the powder in it, and the bullet on top. The way we know cartridges today. Prior to that, of course, they had to have muzzle loaders where you loaded from the top. And then they got some paper cartridges where the powder was wrapped in paper. They had all sorts of variations of that before they finally came up with this internal priming compound in the rim of the cartridge. And that's why it's called a rim fire. We'll hold up an example here for you. The rim actually has a primer put in it wet and then it's spun so that all the primer gets to the edges. And then when the firing pin hits on that edge, that's what squeezes it and ignites it. And that, of course, ignites the main powder charge, launches your bullet. That's the difference between a rim fire and a center fire. The center fire, of course, has a replaceable primer stuck in the center of the back of the case. So the rim fires have one small problem. Well, maybe it's a big problem. And that is, in order to squeeze that case and ignite that, the case itself has to be fairly soft. And then if you hit it too hard, it blows open and you get the gases coming the wrong direction. You want them following the bullet out the bore, pushing it out the bore, not back in your face. So it's kind of tricky to get the pressures just right and the thicknesses of the brass and everything just right on that case. So typically your 22s, whether it's the short, long or long rifle, your pressures are going to be under 20,000 PSI. And then when you step up to some of the bigger ones, that pressure will go up a bit. But that, again, makes it a little more challenging to get uh, the thing built just right and consistent firing with different firing pin tensions and that sort of thing. So it's a little bit tricky building those 22s. So the first 22 came along in about 1845 or a little earlier than that. And they started with the uh, caps back in the day when they were getting away from flint locks and they put a cap on the cap locks that cap had the priming compound in it well somebody thought why don't we just put a little bb on top of that to fit it and shoot the whole thing out in one bang and that became sort of a parlor fun gun it really wasn't considered to be a, a self-protection device or a hunting rifle or anything like that it was just shooting tiny little bbs out of those cb caps well you can still get cb caps i might even have some here and rifles you know, they're made at any rate, and it's not exactly the same, but it's a really short little thing with hardly any powder in it and shoots a tiny little bullet. Well, then they went up to shorts, and then Smith & Wesson got involved, and I think they built the first actual 22 short in a Smith & Wesson revolver. Uh, and then they extended it from there. They went to longs and then long rifles, and then in oh, the late 20th century, we got things like the CCI Stinger, which increased the length of the case just a little bit on that 22 and lightened up the bullet a smidgen and got more velocity out of it. 
But, you know, that's about all you can do with that 22. Um, and Winchester came up with an idea of lengthening it a lot. And they did that in 1959 with the 22 uh, Winchester Magnum. It's a Winchester Rimfire Magnum. And uh, that one got to be fairly popular because it increased the velocity. Now, a typical 22 long rifle called high velocity will have around 1,250 feet per second pushing a 40 grain bullet. The uh, 22 Magnum increased that velocity to around 1,800 to 1,900 feet per second. So that was significant. But as you can see, Neither of them is particularly long and sleek. They do not have what we call a high ballistics coefficient. So they run out of gas fairly quickly because they're pushing so much air out of their way. But still, they're great little rounds for fairly close shooting. And we're going to do some numbers and see what their maximum point blank ranges are and how much energy they carry down range. But we're going to move on to what have become, well, in the 21st century, the new hot 17 rim fires. And I think everyone knows the first one up, and that is Hornady's 17 HMR. Hornady Magnum rim fire. That thing really took off. Came out in 2002. And all it is is the 22 case, the 22 mag case, neck down to 17, and it throws a 17 grain bullet. Not much there, but it throws it so fast about 2,500 to 2,550 feet per second. And man, that makes for a long reach with pretty flat trajectory. Even though it doesn't have quite the energy that the 22 carries in that 40 grain bullet, it just reaches out there so far. And it proved to be pretty successful on small rodents. A lot of vermin, squirrels, rabbits. Uh, I shot up to, we'll say, red fox and... Uh, raccoons and quite a few people. We use them on coyotes. So it really became a popular round just because it's what we've always been looking for. When we were kids shooting 22s, we wanted to move up in speed and velocity so we could reach out further for those jackrabbits we were hunting. And the 22 mag was all the only option we had. And back in those days, they were a lot more expensive. You know, when you're scrounging up a dollar to buy a box of cartridges, you don't want to have to spend two dollars for the same number. Um, and then the other thing was that there weren't that many rifles made for it, and they were not all that accurate. And I don't know exactly why, but uh, they sort of got poo-pooed because the accuracy was not quite up there with the uh, standard 22s. But the 17s really changed that. So the 17 HMR came along, and uh, that was so successful that they decided to come up with a smaller one. The world's smallest cartridge is the 22. Can you see this little guy? It's the 17, it was a 22, till they changed it to the 17 Mach 2. And what they did was they took that CCI Stinger case, which was a little bit longer than the standard long rifle on the 22, and they necked it down to 17, and they drive the same 17 grain bullet as the HMR, but they can only push it about 2,100 feet per second. And that's right about twice the speed of sound, depending on the, the uh, altitude you are. You're down at sea level, it's around 1,000, 1,100 uh, feet per second is the speed of sound. So 2,100, close enough, they're going to call it Mach 2. That did not exactly set the world on fire when it came out. And fairly soon, they stopped building rifles for it, and then they stopped making ammunition for it. And we thought it was dead in the water. But Savage, to its credit, continued to make rifles. They chambered rifles for that guy. And for some reason, it caught on again, and they started making ammo. And now you can get ammunition for that from several different brands. So I think that Mach 2 is making a comeback and it may be around to stay. And I'm glad it is because I have found this to be what I consider probably the optimum squirrel hunting cartridge. And I say that because the uh, 17 HMR is great for the same job, but it's got so much explosive energy that you even hit a squirrel in the head with it and you're probably going to lose the front quarters. So it's just a little more oomph than you need for a squirrel. And even this short little Mach 2 I've used on squirrel hunts, and I have have to be pretty careful to take a broadside headshot. If I take a straight-on headshot, that squirrel is going to lose some meat back in the, the front quarters, even with this little guy. 
But the reason I think it's the ultimate for tree squirrels is you're shooting up in the air, and if you hit a limb, you're just going to knock that tiny little 17-grain bullet to pieces. So there's very little ricochet. With a solid 40-grain slug like you get in a 22, there's a lot of ricochet, and if you've shot 22s a lot and plinked with them, you've probably heard it. And off it goes. You know, there's not a lot of energy in that bullet, but you still you don't want a bullet flying around in the air in unspecified directions because of a ricochet. And then shooting up into the trees like you do for squirrels, that potentially that bullet could go a long way. So it just makes it, I think, a lot safer to break up the bullet if you miss your squirrel in the branches beyond. Um, and also, yeah, I think even if that bullet did get somewhere downrange and maybe strike a cow inadvertently or something. It's so tiny and it should have such little bit of remaining energy. I'm not sure it would do any significant damage or maybe even any damage at all. Of course, you still want to be safe with them all the time, but I just think it adds a little safety factor to shooting with a small rim fire for small gain. So there is your world's smallest cartridge, and we're going to look at some numbers on that, compare all the ballistics, the maximum point-blank ranges of all of these. But before we do that, I want to now introduce the world's most powerful rimfire. We're going to the opposite end of the spectrum, and that takes us to the Winchester WSM, Winchester Super Magnum. It's not the short Magnum. I said to a, a friend yesterday, a young fella, hadn't heard of the 17 WSM. And he said, oh my gosh, I must be screaming. And they necked that WSM down to 17 and then it struck me what he was thinking. I said, no, no, this isn't the 300 Winchester short magnum neck down to 17. It's a whole different program. Just happens to have the same initials. 17 WSM super magnum, not short magnum. Well, you look at that and think, well, what's the difference between that and the Hornady 17? I don't know if you can see it right here. We'll probably put some photographs up to have to get pretty close to make these really show. But it's a bigger cartridge all the way around. Let me see if I can stand those guys up. You got that? So what they did with this Hornady HMR, of course, was take that 22 and neck it down. What did they do with the Winchester? As you can see, it's a lot bigger than the 22 Win Mag, too. They went with a 27 caliber nail cartridge, a blank for driving nails in carpentry. They necked that down to 17, and that's how they came up with this one. Now, this guy really screams. 20 grain bullets, so you've got three grains more than the 17, and that doesn't sound like much, but when you put the velocity that that extra powder capacity has in there, you're driving at 3,000 feet per second. That's almost 500 feet per second faster than the Hornady, and that makes a huge difference. We're gonna look at that on our infamous ballistic charts. This chart, I think, is really fascinating. As you look down that list, and we'll put it on the screen here for you, you see, uh, first of all, look for those MPBR. Those are maximum point blank range for a two inch diameter circle. I figure that's about a squirrel's head or a cottontail head. If you can hit that by a dead center aim out to 100 yards or so, that makes for a pretty long reach for small game hunting, right? That would be your maximum point blank range. So the way I set these up when I zeroed them, we are not going to go more than an inch above our point of aim. And when we drop an inch below our point of aim, that's the end of our two inch target reach. So the maximum point blank range on the 22 long rifle is 83 yards. Step down to the 22 wind mag where we thought we were going to really improve it. That only goes to 115 yards. The Mach 2 actually goes a little bit farther. That tiny little guy will reach it out to 120 yards. Pretty remarkable for small game shooting and another reason that I like it for a tree squirrel round. The 17 HMR is pushing it out to 145 yards and I have taken it out to 150 yards on uh, ground squirrels quite handily. Um, and it, I just love it for uh, any kind of an infestation of a ground squirrel in somebody's alfalfa field because you can really reach out there. When those squirrels start to go under, you're still able to stretch it out another 40, 50 yards. And then the 17 WSM takes it all the way to 182 yards. That is getting out there on a flat, flat trajectory with a two inch target. Pretty impressive. So then you can look at the 50 yard, 100 yard, 150 yard and 200 yard drops and drifts and get an idea how once again, you just go down the line and 
it's improvement after improvement with these rim fires, except for the difference between a 22 win mag and that 17 Mach 2. That Mach 2, because of that lighter, sleeker bullet with a higher BC, well, it's not higher, it's actually five points or 0.5. Uh, how would I explain that? Let's just say the 22 Win Mag is a 130 BC and the Mach 2's bullet is a 125. But because it has faster launch speed at the muzzle, that's where you get your improvement. So you look out there on your drops and they're pretty close to the same. You're looking at maybe an inch, half inch difference between them. But you've got a lot more energy in the 22 Mag. But do you need that energy on a squirrel? I don't think so. So that's the only two that don't just match up with a steady improvement down the line. You certainly see it though with the um, HMR and the WSM. You just extend your range, you reduce your drift, you reduce your drop, and you end up with that WSM as the top of the heap. I mean, that's, that's the one if you want to maximize your rimfire. And right now that is the world's most powerful rimfire for reaching out there. You know, there's plenty of power when you start off with that 22 win mag, but not as much as that 17 WSM, even though it's got a lighter bullet at 3000 feet per second really helps. So all of these are going to be quite explosive. You're not going to expect a lot of penetration on anything. That's not what they were designed for. Although there are different bullet options. And I know for a while they had some full metal jacket bullets and I tried those on prairie dogs. I couldn't even tell I was hitting the prairie dog. It was just like a miss, a miss. They wouldn't react. Then they trot off after a few seconds and fall over. So uh, I wasn't real, real keen on those. I want to hit something. I want it to be gone right now or as quickly as I can. But you may find an application for those. Now, there are some issues with rifles with some of these. Obviously, 22s, they've got that figured out for easily 150 years. So you can find all sorts of 22s and all sorts of actions. When you get into the 17s, though, things get a little tricky. And one thing you will find hard to find are autoloaders. You know, Ruger with their 1022 tried to make it a 17 HMR 22. Didn't work out so well. It, it, that extra pressure in those bigger cartridges are messing it up. So you're slamming that bolt back so hard that you're doing damage so they had to slow it down or make it heavier and try to, try to tweak it just so. And they just weren't having luck with it. Volkartsen tried it in their rifle. And I had one. It was shooting beautifully, but it was, at first it cracked a stock from it, slamming back. They made some adjustments, put some titanium in, tried to get it fixed up. I guess they just never really could get it perfected. So they gave up on it. But the, um, the smaller one, that Mach 2, I think there's an auto loader out. I think Savage might have one. There are a couple of other brands that aren't real well known and real popular that are successful with those in an auto loader. So you might want to look for those. Otherwise, you're looking at bolt actions and brake actions, except for some AR-15 styles. There are at least two out there that I have heard carry it and do quite well with it. A lot of folks reported back that they were enamored of the function. It was just always doing what it was supposed to do and quite accurate. So if you're an AR fan, you might be able to swap out the uppers and get one in a 17. At one time, I got a barrel and a switch out system from someone who was trying to perfect it. And we could never get it to be consistent. Sometimes it wouldn't go off. Sometimes it wouldn't eject properly. And I sent it back and the gentleman was going to fix it and get it back to me. And I never saw it again. So I don't know if it's impossible or if he just gave up on the project. But there are at least two ARs out there that are doing the 17 HMR successfully. And a couple of them, I think, are doing the WSM as well. So you want to look for those. I have here on the table some examples of some easy to find rifles in 17s as well as the 22s. This is the um, Contender. And most of us know this single shot from Thompson Center. I got this one in the Mach 2. I just need to put a scope back on it and I'm uh, squirrel hunting. So pretty simple. You just break action, load it up, cock the hammer, take your shot. People love these because you can swap barrels back and forth. A lot of folks have them in a 22 already. So there's a fairly inexpensive way to move up. One of my favorites for the um, Hornady Magnum Rimfire is this Ruger. It's the 7717. What puzzled me is why they didn't make the same system, 
successfully with the WSM. They had one and I had it and was shooting it and always having a little bit of problem getting consistent groups with it. It was more like an inch and a half when I thought I should be getting under an inch. But I have since heard from folks who said that they've made a couple of changes and their rifles are shooting half inch or better with the WSM and they were really excited about it. I'm not sure Ruger is still making and offering that one, but worth looking into. Even if you find an older one, I think they have some aftermarket triggers and things that might be fixing that up. And then one that I currently have for the WSM is uh, one of the first ones that was chambered in it, and that is Browning's version of the Winchester 85. And this is a single shot that was invented by Browning in 1878. And I did a video on this one. You can check it out. I got this guy shooting down under an inch and a few times at half inch. So it took uh, a bit of work sanding on the forend and then really perfecting my technique. It had to be real easy because it's got such a slim forend that wants to rock in the cradle when I'm shooting off the bench. But it certainly has the accuracy there. For a thin barrel and a fairly light rifle, I'm, I'm pressed and it's doing a great job. I have taken those out uh, in the ground squirrel fields and just had a great time because they reach out so far. I was reaching out to 200 yards and while doing some testing, I went out to 300 yards and I got a two and I think it was two and three quarter inch five shot group at 300 yards one time with the wind deflections and sort of, that's pretty impressive with a little bullet like that. So uh, you've got the chart there. We maybe put it up again for you to study for a little bit, but go to my website um, and look also on YouTube. I've got some older videos on these cartridges back in, oh gosh, a good, probably even getting on to eight, nine years ago. Some fairly popular ones on the WSM. There's one that shows um, some of the impact when I was shooting jugs of water with the 22, 17 HMR, and I think the 17 WSM. I don't remember if I had a 22 Win Mag in there, but that's kind of fun because you can see the differences in the impact. The 22 just puts a hole in it, and with the uh, Mach 2 or the uh, Hornady HMR, they make a pretty significant splash and jump that bottle up in the air. But with the uh, WSM, there's a significant explosion. <laughs> you can really tell the pressure differences on those. So once again, you look at the numbers and that on the energy, and that's what's impressive about that WSM, in addition to being the flattest, it carries more energy than the 22 Win Mag with a 40 grain bullet. So 20 grain to 40 grain, you'd think it would be less, but it's considerably more energy. That doesn't mean it's going to penetrate as well, but again, as I said, these explosive bullets weren't designed to penetrate all that much anyway. You're shooting them into fairly small animals, so they're going to come to pieces in the thoracic cavity, and you're going to get a pretty dramatic and instantaneous demise. And that's what you want with your little 17 calibers. So those are the 17s with some 22s thrown in to put things in perspective. That is the rimfire family. Now, the one little caveat, not really a caveat, but just an extra plug here at the end, someone is surely going to bring up the five millimeter Remington. This was a 1969 project, I'm pretty sure. Remington came out with, and it's similar to a 22 mag, but it's neck down to 20 caliber, five millimeter. And that one was fairly, cons well, it was, it was not widely accepted, but I thought it was pretty darn effective. It does not match the WSM 17 here, but it went away in just a few years. I don't know if people weren't ready for it yet or what, but that was at the time the fastest and hardest hitting um, rimfire cartridge. I borrowed a rifle, believe it or not, from my English teacher in high school. <laughs> what a great guy. <laughs> he let me borrow his Remington rifle and take it out fox hunting. And as luck would have it, I snuck up on a fox and took him with that to that five millimeter. So I was pretty excited about that. But at the time, I didn't have enough money to buy a rifle. I wish I'd had. But then it went away. They quit making the ammo for it. Now, I think Aguilla is making uh, ammunition for it again. So look around and you can find that five millimeter Remington rimfire ammunition. So that's the story on the rim fires here in the 21st century. They're still going strong. I would invite you to take a careful look at one or more of these 17s. It's 
It's kind of fun to have the world's smallest 17 and the world's most powerful rimfire in the same arsenal. So there's something for you to look forward to. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer thanking you for watching. Invite you to subscribe to our channel. Join us on Patreon. Until next week, hunt honest and shoot straight.